I know. I feel like my teacher is watching me. Oh, <laughs> like if I was a student teacher and the real teacher's watching and there's that pressure, that is how I feel. We all have big dreams and these fantasy lifestyles in our mind we wish were our reality. Meanwhile, we watch others seemingly make it happen. I'm Rachel Denson, a farm girl turned mortgage guru, moonlighting as your self-help cheerleader. Together, we'll pull back the curtain with intentional conversations and discover how you get there. Welcome to How You Get There. It's week three and we are already celebrating, even though this is only my fourth live episode, How You Get There has officially been out in the world for a hundred days now. It's a milestone I want to celebrate, but I also thought it was the perfect time to reflect on what all has transpired, how things have changed, what growth has happened, and the dreams I have for it for the future. Along with that, you know, I'm all about pulling back the curtain. So I would love to introduce to you Joel Sharpton. Joel owns Pro Podcasting Services and has been a catalyst for making how you get there be a real thing. Thank you so much, Joel, for being here. Thank you, Rachel, for having me. It's it's a lot of fun. And it's been fun to be on your your whole journey. Your your journey in particular is reminding me of a lot of things that I, I like about podcasting, period. You know, we were just talking before we started the recording. One of the things that I always try to remind my clients, almost none of them, is content creation itself their job, right? A lot of them do make money on their content creation, and almost all of them, their content creation in some way sort of feeds into their business and helps their bottom line overall. But even for me, it's good for me to make videos. It's good for me to make YouTube, you know, clips. It's good for me to make podcasts directly, mm -hmm. but editing your podcasts and videos is the thing that actually <laughs> makes my money. So right. I do like an opportunity though, when I can come on and share a little information with you, but at the end of it, I'll be very frank and selfish here. I'm going to get some content out of this that I'm going to be able to share with my audience too. And, and, and it will help my bottom line. So, so well, it's I'm... a virtuous cycle here. Your, your podcast though has been a lot of fun to work through and your uh, attitude about it is infectious. Even well, when we were thanks. just offline then, <laughs> you were telling me your goals for it and, and where some of the places that you're already dreaming of taking it. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, that's what's awesome about podcasting. And that's what's awesome about, you know, being a content creator at this time we really do have an opportunity to do an amazing thing on basically free platforms. And that's yes. Cool. Yes. Well, and that's what I was, I was talking to a friend as I have been. So in real time, we are not even a full seven days out from the, uh, the first live episode. And as I started pushing out the short form clips to market the episode before it was live and then you know throughout afterwards it hit me that what's so fun about this kind of content is what the value the value exchange that i'm trying to get people to buy into it's free all it is is their time and unlike in my day job when somebody is working through deciding on getting a mortgage what loan officer they choose you know the value exchange item, it costs money and the stakes are quite high. So it's so fun to be able to post these videos and just think, okay, the finish line is so much shorter here versus, you know, trying to get a client, hopefully hanging on to them while they're trying to find a house for a few months and then get them to the closing ta table 30 days later. And then hopefully, you know, my plan is to be their loan officer forever. That's such a, a, a long, a slow burn, a long game. This is just, okay, get them to give me a chance. If it's the audience, if they are my audience, they will love how you get there and then they will stay. And it's, it's free. So uh, it's exciting to make a video, post it, and then think also the power of like, okay, if this one goes viral, it could get me a lot of new audience listeners. And once again, if they like it, they'll stay. So it's just, it's so different than what I do most of the time that I think that part has been especially fun. I, it is, it is very different, obviously. Ooh. And the big thing with um, your day job, as you called it, you know, mortgage, there's so much regulation and uh, uh, red tape and like, 
specific things to go through, right? Mm -hmm. With podcasting and with content creation, there are a lot of checklists along the way. That's one of the things that I was excited that you recognized is like, hey, this is a this is a journey. We started a long time ago. You contacted me even before, well, from the first day you contacted me till the release of this episode's 100 days, but but yep. we, you know, you knew that this was going to take a while and as we heard in one of your previous episodes, you've been thinking about this and and planning on creating a show for even longer than that. A lot of clients come to me though, Rachel, and they they have a very much like I want it now, I want it yesterday kind of kind of attitude. <laughs> and I mean, we can look, it's e content creation is easy. You can mm -hmm. record a video with your phone and post it to Instagram, and that can be all that it takes. But if you want to be thought out about it, if you want to run through the proper channels and give yourself a proper leg to stand on for the long haul, which is the way that you wanted to approach this for sure. And I think mm. it's the way that most people that are serious about it do, then it does take a process. In your case, it's like right at three months, basically, but from, and, but that's from initial discussions. What is this going to look like and what shape mm -hmm. should it take? We didn't even have the name locked down that first time we talked, did we? Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to, and Joel, before we even go there, what I wanted to explain a little bit more is because so many people it's that are listeners right now are usually in, uh, I'm hearing from a lot in my immediate community. So like at the gym, people are, Hey, I've seen, I've listened to your podcast. It's really cool. But a lot of what people are saying is how did you even meet this guy? Like, how do you even, where is he from? What, did, what happened there? And so I have to explain, and I'd like to explain to anybody who's wondering and hasn't personally asked is Joel and I got connected because back in last February, my company had a sales retreat and they had a speaker, Kyle Draper. He's at coach Kyle online. He what is a social media coach and his bread and butter is uh, being a speaker at conferences and coaching clients personally, but he had has a podcast. And so when I connected with him post conference, I was interested in what he had to say on just social media, but I just took the chance to say, how are you doing all of this and make a podcast? Because I wanted to make a podcast and I can't even get past how I don't even know the terms of what I need, even need to do to make it exist. And his exact words were, I got a guy. I'll, I'll send you his email. And that's basically what he said. He was like, Joel, meet Rachel. I'll let you two take it from there. So that's how Joel and I got connected. But it shows you, as cheesy as it is, the power of social media and that the world is and it makes the world smaller than what you think because i mean i liked kyle at the conference but really i saw the validity of kyle and his work by being able to easily find him online and i trusted his reference and so i just love the power of like a referral based business and especially considering that's how Joel and I got connected. So, <laughs> and that's that's my entire business from day one. So, so Rachel, my story quickly. I come from the radio world. Great, because I wanted you to tell it. That my exact notes says how Joel. Will you tell us how you get how you got here? <laughs> how I got here? Yeah. So, yes. so I'm going to try to be. My my wife always tells me anytime I go on a client's podcast, she's like, "Be brief. Remember, it's their show, <laughs> not yours." <laughs> so uh, it's, it's too much. Let me sum up a uh, quote from the Princess Bride there. So I I grew up in a small town, North Louisiana, and I, uh, I got into theater the summer before I turned 13. And I discovered that I loved it. Like from day one, I was just like, boy, I like being on a stage. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I got to college, I, I didn't think that I wanted to do theater you know, for my career, because I, in, in my world from North Louisiana, like you didn't, that wasn't a thing you could do. Like even a, even if I was going to go be a movie actor, like that's not a thing you can really be successful at either. That's like a one in a million. So what was I going to do? And I thought I'd maybe teach. I thought I'd do, go to law school and, and be a lawyer for a while. Anyway, what ended up happening was I, I, I got a double degree in poli sci and uh, uh, theater and theater was what I was really enjoying the most except that the pathway that I had been shown while I was in college to a career 
was to travel and get like six month gigs here and nine months there and three months here and four weeks here. And so you literally traveled around the country until you developed enough of a, a resume to go and make it in like Chicago or New York or LA. Okay. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll do that. Except I had fallen in love <laughs> and I was like, I want to get married. You know, I don't know what else I want to do, but I want to get married to this woman. And so, so we did, we got married the July after I graduated college and she went back to school and finished her degree in French. But uh, that meant I needed a job because we were going to stay there where, where we were going to school here in Ruston, Louisiana. That's where I live now, actually. Like literally I was just like, installing stereos for people and doing like odd jobs for a minute. And a buddy said, Hey, have you tried the radio station, the local radio station group here? There's like four stations that were owned by one small company. They've hired a bunch of theater kids over the years. I bet they'd love to have you. And so I went and they put me on the air that night, midnight, uh, midnight. <laughs> oh to six my goodness. Night. Were you prepared for that? No, not, not <laughs> remotely, not remotely prepared for that. But at the same time, like there's no, I, at the same time I was, I'd spent the last, you know, 10 years on stage. And so I knew how to perform even extemporaneously. I knew how to right. read from a script with feeling, right. Which is mm -hmm. like the biggest part of radio is they tell you what to say. You've got this news tidbit or you've got this weather delivery, or you've got this ad read or whatever. And uh, I mean, ostensibly you're supposed to spend hours and hours in prep, but really DJs pick it up. And they read the best they can with feeling, right? Well, because, I mean, you get new stuff every day. I mean, if you, you would never, you know, you'd be on the hamster wheel all the time. The big guys who have like a team behind them, like they show up, you know, if you do a morning show, you're on from six to 10, uh -huh. Bob and Tom show or something. Okay. Or, or Howard Stern. Howard Stern shows up probably an hour and a half, two hours before his show and is, and is fed prep by his producers and staff, right? But a, a small town morning DJ or midday DJ, mm -hmm. what you've got is like a computer readout that you can go over. Anyway, right? but those skills translated, you know, I was game for whatever they wanted me to do, which is the biggest thing in small town radio. So I worked my way up and I, I that's what I did. That was my career all of a sudden. I was there from 2004 until 2007. My wife at the time graduated and, and she wanted to move. She wanted to go down south. So we moved to New Orleans for a few years. We had our kids, mm. our two boys. And then when we separated, we moved back to Ruston because we both had people here that we thought we might could, you know, start over with as far as like a new job and things like that. Right. But also her parents are about an hour away. My parents are about an hour away. This was a nice place to settle. So I went back to the radio station. That was in 2011, I guess, when we moved back. It was right after the Saints won the Super Bowl. I always say like God gave me that Super Bowl so that I didn't think about the fact that I was losing my marriage. <laughs> Literally, I was, I mean, obviously we were living in New Orleans. I was a huge Saints fan, but like every Sunday for three and a half hours or so, the whole city would shut down. You just got absorbed into that. Yes. I, it didn't matter what, like what else was happening. Yeah. And, All of life melted away and you just got to be a football fan. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. It that. was really, that was a special, special. Anyway. That's I, like running. Yeah. But I mean, there are, I think honestly, and I, I, I contributed that to God, but like the universe or whatever you want to chalk it up to. I do think yeah. that in, in some of our worst moments of stress, if we're open to it, there are things that are presented to us that allow us to bear it and to move forward, you know, in positivity instead of like dwelling in it. Absolutely. Right? And you got to be open to it. You know, if the relief boats come and you say, no, God's going to save me. Well, he's listening to the relief boats. Yeah. But I'm, I'm working in radio and I met my mm -hmm. now wife, Kelly, and she and I were mm -hmm. talking one day. She was, we were in my, my bedroom in the apartment that I, I was living in at the time. And I'm standing at my desk working on my computer on whatever I was making that day. And I mm -hmm. was telling her about the podcast that I was listening to currently. This was in um, 2011, 2012. And she said, well, 2012, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. The next year after we had moved back to Ruston, she says, Hey, why don't you have a podcast? And I started to answer her. And I realized the answer that I was about to give wasn't, that's not really true. That's not a, like, that won't keep me from doing it. And then I started to answer right. again. And that reason wasn't true. And anyway, I went through three or four and I was just like silent for a minute. I finally turned around and I said, I don't know, maybe I should start one. 
And so I did like within a weekend, uh, I had called my best friend and I said, Hey, let's, let's go record the first episode of a show. And we started a very, very silly show called two guys, one podcast. The only reason we <laughs> named it that was because I came up I, my, the, here's a Rachel, here's a great example of how for different people, the thing that is holding them back from starting a show is different things. Here was one of the things that okay. I had stumbled over in the past is, is like coming from radio. How do you start your show? How do you open your show? How do you close it? Like, what what is the format of the way that you're going to talk to your audience? And I didn't have one. I didn't have a way in. I didn't have a gimmick for what for whatever, whatever reason. You were so technical that it was. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. It was anyway, I was stumbling over it. And for whatever reason, she said, why don't you have a show? And I started talking through all the reasons why not. And I didn't have any good ones. And I said, I, maybe I will start one. And so what I came up with that day was we're going to have a podcast, me and my, my best buddy. And my best buddy mm -hmm. is this guy named Josh. He's the godson of my daughters. He at the time worked for Raising Cane's, like the corporate okay. the national the food chicken. chain. Yeah. He was like, a, I can't remember the title, but he was effectively like a franchisee. He didn't own the franchise, but they didn't okay. have franchisees at the time. He was like, he was general manager, but he also owned a portion of the, anyway, he was a big wig locally and, he was and important. had aspirations. <laughs> Yeah, well, and they didn't want him obviously to be public on something where we were going to curse maybe and tell uh, silly okay, stories okay. and be crass or whatever, right? Right. So he was going to have to be anonymous. And we had already, like that had already come up previously because I think we had talked about maybe doing a recording something one time and he's like, I can't, I can't ever let my public persona, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I was going to be one guy. He was going to be the other guy. And, and so somehow in all of that, I said, ah, I know what the intro is. The intro to the show is welcome to two guys, one podcast. I'm one guy. He's the other. And this is the podcast. And I don't know why, but that just like, that was what helps you click. Oh, that's a show. Let's do a show. So we did. And we did like, I don't know, almost 200 episodes of that, I guess, like 150 or something. And then towards the end of that run, Josh and I, every week when we would come into the studio to do an episode, before we started recording, he and I would talk about the podcast that we had, the new podcast we had discovered and had been listening to. And, and we mm. would discuss what was good about him, what was bad, what we liked, what we didn't like. And he one day said, man, this, this conversation is way better than the podcast that we make. And it was, it was like the podcast we made was funny. You know, a few thousand of our friends and, and people who had become our friends, I guess, were enjoying it. But it mm. was like, it was nothing. It was not going to ever be anything really. It was just for funsies. And what he and I were talking about doing this like podcast review discussion of this like new burgeoning medium that had legs. We were like, we could do something with that. So that became pod on pod for a while. And we did podcast reviews for like a year. And then we got picked up by this group in LA. They wanted to do something with us. And so that show shifted to always listening podcast reviews. And we did that for a few years, like 150 episodes or so. And through that show, I met, all or through those shows, Pod on Pod and Always Listening, I met mm -hmm. just a billion people in the podcast space, just just tons and tons of people. We went to a bunch of conferences and I was speaking at conferences and got very embedded in, in the podcast sphere. What year is this at this point? This is like from 2012, 13, 14. Okay. 15 was really like the culmination. So in 15, I spoke at three conferences, I think. Okay, because I looked up, because I remember the first podcast I listened to was the Serial podcast, you know, by NPR. And that was, I think... So I, I saw her speak after season one was out. Season two mm -hmm. hadn't started yet. I saw her speak at one of those conferences that I spoke at, too. Okay. Like, she, my wife, I snuck my wife in. <laughs> my wife had gone to the conference, but not to the conference. Like, she was hanging out in the hotel room and stuff. But I snuck her in with somebody else's badge the last day so that we could see Sarah Koenig speak. We were hopeful, honestly, that she was going to tell us whether she thought he did it or not. And oh. she wouldn't even then be committal. You, I mean, you know, like the result of that, yeah. right? Like there was the documentary on HBO. Yes. Well, I haven't watched the documentary on HBO, but I mean, he's free, right? Free now, right? He's out. He's currently free. He's currently free. It's still like waiting, like fine. He's not like, he's not been exonerated. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think he will be exonerated. I think what will happen is they will end up finally crushing the case against him, mm -hmm. but he won't, he, I don't think he's ever going to be by the courts officially declared as not the killer, which I think is a little sad. I think, I don't think he did it. Um, I mean, this is yeah. way off topic now. But
Well, 2014 though is when it came out. That was and a moment. It was, it was, and I remember. So I have a cousin named Jackie. Shout out to Jackie. She is always the one pushing me to like learn new things, and she's on the forefront of stuff. And but she is the one that introduced cereal to our family, and then we all just got ate up with it, and we just talked about it all the time. Like it was a whole thing it just it so it was really the first one that kelly and i my my wife now it was the first one that we listened to together she early on when we were dating she didn't listen to podcasts really at all she occasionally would listen to one that i would play her but she thought it was like i mean it, the stuff that i listened to wasn't for her right it right. was like very nerdy sports podcasts very nerdy tech podcasts I listened to some comedy podcasts, I guess. A bunch of comedians had podcasts. There were some really good ones. But anyway, it was just a different world. And Serial was like this beautiful film, but told it through was, this new medium. Yeah. You know, it was wonderful. But it was, so I just was trying to line this up about how early on you. Yeah, like where were yeah, we? Sorry. You were in, you. in, but this was all coming to a head when, while you were very much embedded in one of the, you know, already talking as a speaker at these conferences around the same time. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Like before the mainstream got there, I, I had a name in the yes, space, you'd which been I guess there. is like, I was, I was early to the game and then I didn't play the right games at the right time, or maybe I should be <laughs> running a, a big media company, right? Maybe maybe Spotify should have bought me by now, Rachel. I don't know why it <laughs> didn't happen. Anyway, but, but what I found though was I was, I had hit a dead end in radio. Like I had made the most money that I right. could make at the local station without becoming the general manager. And I didn't want to be the general manager because the general manager job sucked in my opinion. Right. And so I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? And the way to make more money in radio is to move. You move to a bigger market. So from Ruston, I'd go to somewhere like Baton Rouge or, or New Orleans, maybe Dallas or Atlanta, you know, and then the big ones are like Atlanta, LA, New York, Chicago. Right. So that's the way to make money in radio or always has been this. You got to remember this was so far before like this work from home culture that we're in now, where even in radio, a lot of people are, are able to, you know, do their full thing from a home studio. And, and so like maybe now I never would have found podcasting like I did, but what I discovered then was I was like, Oh, I could just start doing this stuff at home and I could do voice work. That was my thought initially. I was like, I could do a little bit of podcast editing, but what I really thought the moneymaker was going to be was voice work. I'd do audiobooks, which I had already done like probably four at that point. I'd voiced four audiobooks and and produced them. That's so cool. So I've voiced like probably twelve or thirteen total. I I don't I haven't done it in a long time. I haven't done a single audiobook, voice one anyway, in like probably four or five years now, Rachel. That is another one of those careers that I'm like, how do you end up in that? How do you get signed up to try out? Generally, you lose your gig in radio. <laughs> or or you decide that radio is not for you anymore. And so you start doing voice narration. What we've had now is a lot of people from the stage and screen are finding when, when they can't keep jobs in those areas, they can book a lot of voice work in, in audiobook narration. But do you have to find an agent or do you just like submit your voice somewhere? You absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You can submit your voice somewhere. So we'll put these, we'll put this in the, in the show notes just in case people are interested. But so Amazon owns audible, right? You, I'm sure right. most people know that. Okay. They yep. also own this thing called acx.com. acx.com is audible creators exchange. Dot com, I think is what that stands for. And what okay. it is, is a back end so that anyone who owns the rights to their own novel for audio creation, not everybody does, right? Some, mm -hmm. some people like if you make a deal with Random House or something for your book, they probably buy the audio rights too. And so Random House will be in charge of picks the person, right? And yep. that is like 12 people. There's about six or seven men. There are about six or seven women. And they get all of those jobs because they are masterful at it. I would name names, but I would forget somebody and I don't want to offend anybody. There's some, that's a really cool community. Right. We talked about this, about our book club, because Hoopla has a specific Harry Potter narrator and they knew him by name. Wait, 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 wait. It's not Stephen, Stephen Fry, right? The, isn't that his name? Yeah. Laurie and Fry, Stephen Fry, the, uh, the British 
he's like a TV show host and he was a comedian. He had a show with Hugh Laurie from House that was called uh, Laurie and a little bit of Laurie and Fry that they did like a sketch comedy show for years and years. I think that's the guy's name. That's the one that I listened to anyway. I was one like surely they didn't do a new narration. Jim Dale. Oh, oh, oh okay. Narrated by Jim Dale. That's right. Oh, my bad, my bad. Okay, so Stephen Fry did the the British versions of the Harry Potter books, which is what I listened to back when I was listening to those audiobooks. Sorry. I think I listened to him too, because I remember vividly, we had the, the VCR kind of tape that mm -hmm. had the little cassette tapes um, and we would push them in to, is it called a tape recorder? I'm really, yeah, I really sound recorder. like a millennial rent. Uh, no, that's funny. right now because i'm like i think that's what that's called we would push them in there and i would remember sitting with my mom and we would listen to them everywhere we went because i was obsessed like i can hear the man talking as hermione in my head right now we are like way off so here. far I'm, so sorry. I'm gonna have to edit so much in this episode there you go that's why that's what you got me for but but my point was though so so I I said, okay, what I'm going to do is audiobook narration. I'll do a little bit of voice work for radio stations around the country, right? Because people will want me to do that. And I've got a network that I can lean on there. And then this podcasting thing is pretty cool. I bet a handful of these people that are doing well with their shows, they'll hire me to edit their podcasts. And several did. But it turns out that like that is what I got more of. I got more editing jobs in the first two, three, four months than narration jobs. And the more of those I got, the more I got referred, the more I was doing, the more I enjoyed it, the better I got at it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I was getting not, I've always been a very good editor. I think what I got was efficient, right? I can edit at a rate yes. that most people cannot possibly edit. Like with 10 years, it's they couldn't edit it at just as fast like as practice. I did. Yes. You yes, are not exactly. I've put in the 10,000 hours, you know? Yep. I was doing this for well, no, I didn't even do it. So I, I had this conversation and I was like, hey, I think this year, this was at the very end of 2015. Uh, I said, mm -hmm. I think this next year I'm going to go independent. I was telling my wife this and I've got, there were people, a lot of people actually in radio work as 1099 employees, even when they work for a station, because they yep. do these outside gigs, they put it all together. They keep all their income the whole time and pay their own taxes and do things like that. And so there's like efficiencies right. when you, when you do it that way. And as long as you don't work in the office, it's legal too. Like they, I, we had to get it approved by corporate, but my boss had said, yeah, we could, we could do that. And so I was having this conversation with my wife in December of 2015 and thinking, yeah, we'll do it. I'm thinking maybe right after school lets out in May, I'll flip the switch and we'll go independent. And the first week of January, I, like, I don't know, I got back into the office on the third or the fourth and my boss, my general manager, who I love, Gary McKinney, a great guy came and said, Hey, can we talk for a minute? I was like, yeah. He goes, so I talked to the accountants and I talked to our booking and everything. Yeah, we can absolutely move you to 1099 anytime you want to do it, except in our, our system for your payment, we can only make that change at the beginning of the year. So we've either got to do it right now, or you got to wait until 2017. And I said, well, when do you have to tell them? And he said, today. <laughs> so I was like, Yes, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go independent. Do he it. said, "You sure?" And I was like, "No better time than the no better time than the present, boss. Let's let's right. let's go." So, I came home that day and I told my wife, "Hey, I went out on my own today. <laughs> I gave up my job. <laughs> I don't I don't get a W2 this year." She didn't tell me so at the time, but about 6 7 months later, maybe longer mm -hmm. than that. It was maybe closer to maybe closer to a year. I got my first big client. There was a, um, a veterinary uh, a office, well, a, a woman who was a veteran, a veter, veter, veterinarian? veterinarian, veterinarian. That's the word I could not. Rachel, <laughs> mm, boy. Yes. There was a woman who was a veterinarian. I, I can't even remember how she found me, but she got referred to me and she wanted to launch this show and do a bunch of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Here's the pack. You know, I want a whole package of things. And it ended up being like $5,000 worth of work that I quoted her to start. Okay. They said, hey, it really works best for us if we like send you like one payment and, and would do this in a lump. Does that work for you? And I was like, sure. Yeah. How are you going to pay me? <laughs> how are you going to pay me five grand? And she was like, uh, I mean, I'll cut you a check. And I was like, great. You're going to send that through the mail. OK, great. So I got a, I got a five thousand dollar check in the mail. And this was like we've been working independently for. Yeah, maybe let's call it nine months. 
Mm-hmm. Rachel, before this, my the best salary I'd ever made in my life was fifty one thousand dollars in a year. The mm-hmm. the best salary I'd made in radio up to that point, I think I'd made thirty seven thousand dollars one year. And so here okay. I am holding this five thousand dollar check, which is more than <laughs> I'd ever made in a month, almost. You know, right? And I'm like celebrating. I'm like smiling. It's I'd be like, babe, hey, look, you know, we put this in the bank and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure there were bills due, et cetera, et cetera. I don't remember the specifics, but it right. was a great moment. And she goes, I didn't want to say this until now, but I feel like I can tell you, I didn't think this was going to make it. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to be able to pull this now off. Now that it works, I didn't believe you. And I was like, I joke with her all the time that she's the queen of the underhanded compliments, you know, but I was like that. I mean, thank you for not saying so, so far, I guess, because I don't know that I could have gotten up every morning and kept doing it. If you, if you'd been like, I don't think this is going to work out. Right. But that it hadn't been real, right? Like I had taken a big leap into something that none of it made any sense. She hadn't, you can't even now years later, you can't see my work, right? Like I do all these things and I talk to these people and to her, they're just names that I mentioned mostly. Right. And so this check was real though. It was tangible. It was like people value what this dude does and like, how lucky are we that he can do this from his home, you know, from wherever. Yeah. And so boom, it's just taken off from there. We got halved though. I'll be very upfront with you. We got literally cut in half overnight with the pandemic. Really? March 15th, the NBA shut down. And March 17th, I had lost 47% of my business or something like that. I did the calculations that month. It was it was under 50, but it was right at 50% of my business. And I didn't know what I was going to wow. do. I ended up... Were they sports related or was it just... No, because it wasn't just... The, you have to remember the NBA shut down, but that was like the moment that we realized in America that it was real. The NBA literally walked oh, off the I court remember on that a Wednesday vividly. night. Yeah. Okay. But that was the moment that everybody went. I went and got my wedding dress that day. And I remember on the drive up, my Aunt Rose took me because my mom had to go to a funeral. So Rose and I are driving up and we're like, eh, yeah, this thing, whatever. And then by the time we're driving home, the NBA had canceled. We're like, oh my gosh, this is really happening. And it was crazy how we even reflected on the drive home. like wow, we feel totally different about this hours later. And even though, once again, my cousins, Courtney and Jackie, they were telling us that it was, it was real. It was a thing, but there's, they're really smart. And so I, you know, well, I, had, I had been watching it, but at the time my daughters were homeschooled, they were, they were still in pre-K, I think at that point. So like, but they were homeschooled. My wife was a stay at home mom already. I was not like, I'm working from home. So like, so what if the world shuts down, it's not going to be that big a deal. But when the NBA shut down, it immediately became apparent how many millions of dollars they were going to lose like every week, not just one team, but all of the teams. And if they were willing to make that, that decision, then all of the other businesses were going to turn in in this. And they did, right? Everybody followed suit very quickly. And so what happened was, all of my clients were, um, first, first of all, at that point, many of my clients, I wouldn't say 40% of them, but many of my clients were hobbyists. They were people who did a show just for fun and it didn't, it wasn't connected in any way to their business. Most of them had day jobs, not like entrepreneur stuff, you know, and the only client that I have now that is that is like that. The only one that is not a self-supporting business. Well, I say that there's two. I've got two guys that have day jobs. Both of them, though, have a show that produces tens of thousands of dollars every year and more than pays for not only me, but lots of things in their lives, right? So these are like big shows for them now. And both of those guys have produced this like community around it. Anyway, other than that, though, if you have a regular day job and maybe you're getting furloughed or you're getting sent home for some un- unexpected length of time and you don't know, and you've been spending a few hundred dollars a month on a podcast for funsies, that probably goes away right away. And so all of those did, but also a lot of the businesses, they're like, I don't know what my budget is this year because I don't know what the income is going right. to be. I have no way to project it. I cannot spend anything right now on what is like supplementary. 
Yeah, supplementary advertising. Even the people who realized I'm in their advertising budget, they were like, our advertising budget is currently zero or it's currently all but nil and I've only got some contracts outstanding, et cetera, right. et cetera. Like I've never had contracts with my clients. It's always been like month to month. We work, you, you pay me for work and then I do the work. And if you want to pay me again for more work, then we do more work, you know? Right. Anyway, I just overnight, I was gone. I ended up it just popped up in my memories the other day, January of 21, I ended up taking a job doing morning radio again, because like, I was like, I you don't just know. wanted the, some stability. Yeah, I needed yeah. it for my family. I was like, I needed some regular income. So I took like right. a gig that basically was like, it replaced that 40% kind of that had been cut. Yeah. That was the idea. But then within a year, I had replaced that radio income and more. And, and now it was like, off to the races. And here's the difference. Here's the switch. I don't have any hobbyists anymore, other than those two guys that I mentioned, whose shows are not a hobby. They're not a business hobby. in and of itself. Yeah. Right. And then, or they started as a hobby, but now they become right. a business. And then the other thing that happened is I really, really got to lean into the mortgage and real estate space. And especially once the relief funding kicked in, everybody's interest rates went to you know, Everybody nothing. in real estate realized they were going to be okay. <laughs> right. You guys all, so like four or five months in, you were all like, woo wee. And not only were, did all of the real estate and mortgage clients that I already had at that point, but like so many more came out of the woodwork there. Every mortgage and real estate office is like, let me get a podcast out there so I can tell these people about how I need to help them buy a home. Yeah. But, but like, that's a perfect example though of taking advantage of seeing the positive in a terrible situation, right? Nobody wants the pandemic to happen again. And I love when I hear mortgage officers now say, hey, the rates are never going to go back to where they were. And you don't want them to if they go right. back to 2% or 0% or 1% or whatever it was. Something really bad has happened. The world has ended again. So like, we don't want to go yeah. there, right? So yeah, that's, that's, that's like, I love that message. Even even in those hard times, there were good things. Now you say to yourself, oh, there's a 7% interest rate. There's an 8% interest rate. Our parents bought houses at what? Rachel, you tell me, 12 and 15? I don't know. There were very high interest yeah. rates when my parents were buying houses in the in the early 80s. I will say, yes, those houses were cheaper than they are now, right? But like right. my income is a little higher than mom and dad's too. So like, Right. My point is that you have to look at the positive in any situation. And that's what I did. Thankfully, then it, we had a rough few months, but like I dusted off my shoulders and I reached out to those connections that I had made and I leaned even in more to referrals. But back to your very first point, my entire business, my whole clientele is referral based. I have never spent a single dollar on advertisement for my business. You can connect. All the dots of who got you to who. Yep. Every single one. Yep. And so like you, Kyle Draper is the connection for you or me. Kyle Draper was connected to me through a couple of guys, Dustin Brougham and Phil Treadwell. Phil Treadwell mm -hmm. and Dustin, I, I honestly can't remember which one m met me first. I think Dustin met me first and then he introduced me to Phil. But the two of them at the time were working on a project called like the industry syndicate network or something. They wanted to make like a podcast network and that mm -hmm. never exactly happened like they planned. But both of those guys have found tremendous success. Phil Treadwell does the mortgage marketing expert show. Dustin Brougham does uh, the massive agent podcast. Both of them, massive agents over 300 episodes. Mortgage marketing expert is in nearing 200, I think. And he's, you know, shifted his focus a little bit recently on, on that show. But those two guys, and I've thanked them so many times over the years and I've gotten to thank Phil, at least in person. And Kyle, I've seen in person too. Dustin and I have never met still in person, but like <laughs> they saved my life and, and my family's, you know, well-being, honestly, in a lot of ways. Yep. I'm a resourceful guy and I like to think I would have found a way out of this anyway. But those two people and the people that they've connected me to, like, I don't want to fail to mention Renee Rodriguez. I worked for Renee. I filmed some video for him. He's, he does the Amplify podcast and he's got a, a course that he teaches all over the country and world. It's called uh -huh. Amplify. It's like a two and a half day event. I think now you go in, it's like very intensive, it's like 10 seats and, and he helps you pull out your own story uh, and mm -hmm. how to tell it better. And so it's like executives and CEOs and okay. you know people that come to do this. But anyway, I shot a bunch of video for him. He introduced me to a ton of people as well. And, and it's like high quality content, people like you that are doing well in their own business, well-established and are looking to 
not just, as you say, talk about mortgage or whatever their business is, but to have an impact on the world in one way or another, right? right. Like these are people who have found success for themselves in one way or another, and they have an idea to share, or at least an outlook, or even like you, I'm, this is, I love the way that you put it the other day with me on the phone. I'm a seeker personally, and I'm trying to build a community for people who are seeking, right? Like you yep. are always looking for, for a new information and a new idea and a new adventure, which is kind of what this podcast is. It's a combination of that. Yeah. I love it. That is way too long. I talk too, I talk too much, Rachel, but that's how I got here. <laughs> it's okay. You are going to make it, I'm sure, a beautiful little story that is a little bit more condensed, I'm sure. You'll work Everybody your magic else is like, it will be fine. He, it was a 30 second story. Yeah. So we met the person and then, and then bad pandemic and he met I Phil and, and Dustin and yeah. And now he knows Rachel. Sometimes though, you have to get all of it out and then narrow it down. That's why for me, I, and I don't know if it will, you know, we talked about moving targets, but for me right now, the best way that I know to, I can show up and execute well on the, points that we've already talked about for getting out good audio. And some of it is that I do think that there's some natural talent involved, but even when you have natural talent, even when you love to talk and you're a natural born speaker, I would put myself wholeheartedly in that category. You still have to be thoughtful. And what I've realized is the best way for me to get out exactly how what I want to say is to make some notes and get it out on paper and really map out what I want my episode to be about and then go from there. And like you said, maybe as time goes on, that craft becomes, you know, a little bit more efficient, but it just is what it is. Well, I wanted to, I wrote down, speaking of some notes, to pull back the curtain a little bit, you talked a little bit about it, but about what the last 100 days have looked like. So I called you, you said, I like, I had no idea even what my name wanted to be. I mentioned it in a previous episode, but the, for a few years now, the idea I've had for a podcast is, and really even to pull back the curtain a little bit more before I even knew I wanted a podcast, I loved the power of connecting with people online. The second video became a, a medium. I was always that person monologuing on my Instagram stories and wanting to connect through those moments authentically. And so I think I even, I knew I wanted in, to do something like this, had the heart to do something like this, even before I necessarily realized like the way I could do it is through a podcast, but made the podcast idea with a one name in mind with a friend and then realized the friend at that point was not as invested in making it happen. And it, then it was shifting into, okay, if I want to pay to make it happen, then it's this weird, like, okay, I'm paying. Do I have more say? Am I dragging you along? It was, it was a, a pain point of feeling like I was trying to almost force something to happen. And it just hit me, wait. I don't have to just be married to this one podcast idea. I'm a different person today than I was when I thought of this idea. What I want to talk about, it, it's the same, but it is different. So when I called you, it was really with, I think I have a somewhat of an idea of what I want to do. And I know that I don't even know how I get there. And I knew that there was what the one name I'd come up with was how did I get here? Cause that's what I kind of started asking myself is as an audience, what do I want to tell people about? And so much of what I wanted to tell people about were these little nuggets of things that I had learned and I had changed in my life that did not from the outside looking in, not make that much of an change. It, but then as they accumulated, I, w I looked back on myself. I think people look, looked at me and asked and wondered, you look different. You look better. Things, things look different for you. How, how did you do it? And so I thought then the natural question was, well, how, did, how did I get here? And then that was a podcast name. So I was like, well, that's unfortunate. And I remember I was driving through Paducah and I was just kind of trying to talk to myself out loud. And then I thought, okay, not how did I get there, but you know, another version of that, how, 
how you get there. And then the extra irony is, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but I am the most directionally challenged person you'll ever meet. I get lost <laughs> with GPS in a town I have lived in my whole entire life. Like I have had to put GPS on to realize I just had to go a block around and then I still miss the stop sign I needed to turn at. So I thought, you know, for the layer of anybody who knows me, it's extra funny that I'm going to have a podcast called how you get there for the literal sense. So that's really where we started. And then you started telling me, okay, well, this are this is all the things that you need to be able, or this is what we'll do. This is what we'll create. And this is how you literally record, upload all the things. Will you give our listeners a snapshot of that? Yeah. Here's what you need, bare bones to, to have a podcast. First and foremost, a podcast doesn't have to be video. In the modern world, if you are a serious content creator or you want to be, if you have your own business, I think that you should be doing video, but it's not required to be a podcast. A podcast sort of grew up over here on the side. We've got YouTube where YouTube owns the whole widget. That's where the end user, the, the viewer is going to take in the content is at youtube.com or the YouTube app. Mm -hmm. And it's where the creator loads the content. They go to youtube.com, studio.youtube.com technically, or they go to the YouTube app as well and they put their content up there. So right. YouTube has the whole pipeline. On the audio side, that's not what happened. What happened was these little companies popped up. The first one that I remember hearing about was a company called Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N. They're still in existence. They're still mm -hmm. the biggest player in the game. They host content and then that content is served by different apps and directories around the web. That's the way that the audio space grew up. And in the very, you don't need to know all about it, but in the very beginning, it was a big deal that like the iTunes app would support podcasts. And it was like, oh, I can sync uh, my podcast to iTunes on my computer, and then I can plug my iPod in and boom, I can have these audio things that I want to listen to the new ones, the new episodes on my little iPod that I then take with me. Oh my gosh. I forgot you used to have to upload to your iPod. You literally had to plug your iPod. And even I when the totally iPhone first came out, about that. You, I'm going to blow your mind, Rachel. It was like four or five years of the iPhone being out before you didn't have to plug it into the computer to sync too. Like when we first had I the iPhone, the only right. way to back up, the only way to put contacts on it, the only way to put music on it, the only way to put podcasts on it yeah. was to sync by plugging it in. Now there were apps like Stitcher was, a, was around back then, back in, and I'm talking about like 2009, 2010, 2008, 2009, 2010, like right after the iPhone started to blow up. You, the iPhone came out at the end of 2000 or like in the middle of 2007, the first one, but most people didn't buy the first one because it, it didn't have apps and it had super slow internet and it was like $600 for anybody. And then the second one came out and you could buy it with a contract for like 200 bucks. It had 3G internet and it had apps on it. And now people were like, oh, this is a thing now. And so that's the one that really blew up is the second iPhone. Well, that's when podcasting really exploded. And you you only have to look forward. It was like five, six years after that, that the serials of the world start coming around, right? And so that's when Interesting. you, and not just you, but basically every mainstream listener, that's when they came in. It's because the ease of use between individuals and the content was like narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. It got a smaller mm -hmm. hurdle to jump over. And now the apps are built into our phone, which that didn't happen until like, iOS 12, maybe 11 or 12. So like five, six years ago, Apple actually put the, the podcast app on the phone by default. Before that, you had to download it even. So like, anyway, this is still a fairly new medium. I think I listened on an iPhone. That was your first place? Yeah, most people's first place. I think place. so. I think so, yeah. But I do remember I went and downloaded the podcast app. I mean, it wasn't... But yeah, I think it was, or it was an iPod touch. It may have been that. I don't know. You know, I'm young. So <laughs> I have not thought about all these Apple products in so long and I'm not, I'm going to stay on course, but my brain is like going down memory. You're going in a million here. places. So what you have to do, minimum viable podcast, you create an audio file. You host it at one of these audio hosts. So like Libsyn's the biggest one. Anchor, it, it was one for a while. They're now owned by Spotify. So it's actually podcasters.spotify.com. You can go there and create an account for free and host your content there if you would like. And then that's going to plug into apps like Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple mm -hmm. Podcasts, the place where people actually are going to listen to the, the content itself, right? And where do people listen? 
about 50% of the, well, it's not actually 50. In both cases, it's just over 40. Just over 40% of podcast downloads happen through Apple. Just over 40% of podcast downloads happen through Spotify. So together, they're basically 90, 91% of the podcast ecosphere completely. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy when you think about the fact that Spotify didn't even have podcasting until about four years ago, five years ago now, maybe. It's literally like right before the pandemic when they started really? bringing podcasting it. Yes, it was only like a year or two before the pandemic. And and it's such a great choice by them too. I had, a, I, we talked about this once on one of my shows. I had a podcast news show for a while where I discussed these sorts of things in the industry. And when when Spotify bought Anchor.fm, that was the big deal. It was like, oh, we own all those podcasts now because everybody that hosted with Anchor was now a Spotify original podcast, okay. basically. That's their first play. And then they bought Gimlet and they bought a Ringer. They bought mm -hmm. a bunch of other big podcasting companies. But for them, every minute that you spend listening to podcasting is a minute they're making money on you, either through subscription or ad revenue. And they're not spending any money because they're not paying the podcasters for that audio. Like they pay people for music. I didn't even think about that. You have every time you listen to Taylor Swift, they have to pay Taylor Swift, right? It's pennies. Right. It's pieces of a penny. But every time you listen to every minute you're listening to Taylor Swift, they owe Taylor Swift money. Every right. minute they listen to my podcast, they don't owe me anything. They don't share right. the ad revenue with me. We're like, you're welcome. We're letting you be here. You're very welcome for allowing uh, you to host your podcast through. And that's the other thing too, is they don't even host the podcast. Like that's what kills me is like you, I've put my podcast somewhere on the internet and I've said, Hey, anybody can get it through the RSS feed. And now Spotify is using it. And in the beginning I said, don't put your show in, in Spotify <laughs> specifically because they weren't linking back and you were, you couldn't get all the stats like you, we wanted and they've changed. They've become much more podcaster friendly, but like it is, crazy. I mean, you were talking about going down memory lane with the Apple products. I am even now going down memory lane with like the evolutions that this industry has taken. And you almost forget how much has happened. Even recently, even in the recent past. Yeah. So take that audio, put it in one of those audio hosts, and then you have to submit mm -hmm. it to Spotify and Apple. But if you do just those things, just submit it to Spotify and Apple, then you've got a podcast. Like once they approve it and put it out there and people can subscribe. Well, they, we don't use the word subscribe anymore. <laughs> Apple actually started this process. There was some studies done that people linked the word subscribe or subscription. To with, pay. Yes. Your podcast must cost. And they literally, people wouldn't go, people would say, oh, go, go subscribe to my podcast. And pe their aunts and uncles and maybe older generations especially, but even kids would go, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to pay for it. No, my podcast is free. It's free for everybody. It's all over the place. Well, you said you got to subscribe to it. That's hilarious because I put subscribe in my little outro that we're still working on. Now they say follow. Follow the show. Follow. Yeah. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. That's still the language there. But you follow my show in Apple and Spotify. And, and the reason is because especially Apple, but Spotify does this too. They both sell subscriptions, right? Like they have you can in the podcast app now you can sell higher grade premium content or whatever you, you know your show plus or right ad free versions or extra content or whatever so you can follow my show and then if you want you could subscribe to our premium content so that terminology mm. has changed but anyway the point is it can be literally just that simple you can record an audio with your phone you can upload that straight to uh, uh, Spotify's service or a different, you know, media host like Libsyn, and and then you have a podcast. That that's all that it takes. So that's why when you go look at the Apple Podcast directory, I think the latest numbers I've heard they're over four million now total shows in the Apple Podcast directory. But if you go and look at how many shows actively produced an episode in the last, let's say, thirty days, and it's closer to like two hundred thousand. So it's a huge total catalog, but most of those shows are done. Whereas like if you compare, maybe there's like 200,000 podcasts in production right now. Well, I mean, how many blogs are there that are actively being written? Will to? you tell us the stats on that? Because that was one of the encouraging notes that you gave me 
when I, I think it was right before I was going to record my first episode. Cause you're like the arena you're playing in is a lot smaller than you realize. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So people think of the giant shows like the Joe Rogans of the world or WTF with Mark Maron's one that I really love, or, you know, hardcore history has, you know, millions and tens of millions of downloads an episode serial you were talking about, like that one was off the charts, just crazy numbers of downloads. Right. Most shows though, just don't have those sorts of numbers. And these numbers aren't like super fresh and I'm kind of ballparking them here because I haven't heard the latest stats in quite a while. Lipsin, mm -hmm. that company that I mentioned earlier, they do a monthly show, I think, called The Feed, which is its own podcast. And in that show, they report statistics. And so what they what they give is like, hey, if you have X number of downloads this month, then you're better than this percentage of shows. If you have this number, you're better than that percentage of shows, et cetera, et cetera. But like ballpark, six months ago, nine months ago or so, those numbers would have looked roughly like this. If you have more than about 150, 175 downloads per episode after 30 days of release, right? So not the day one, but after a month, if your episode's gotten up to about 150, 175 downloads, you're better than 50% of the shows in production. If you get 1500 downloads or so, you know, maybe it's 1700 now, somewhere in that range, a little less than 2000 though, you're going to be better than 80% of the shows after a month of release. So those numbers aren't insane to hit. There's a big difference between 1,500 and millions. Yes, you know? exactly, I exactly. Mean, that's a much different bar. But Rachel, even in your business where, you know, I'm, you, you mentioned it in a previous episode, so I'm not telling tells out of school. You hit $12 million in total production in your mortgage business. 13.1, Look at you, over 13. Finish it up. <laughs> no, you, I said 12 million in the show, but I just for the record, because I, yes, I had, I had a month left. So <laughs> so you did $13 million worth of business last year. And it's not like you didn't take home $13 million. Obviously, everybody understands how that works. <laughs> right. but, but you did a tremendous amount of business last year. But even you, if if 150 people showed up every week to attend a seminar that you presented, or a Zoom webinar that you did online even, would that move the needle on your business? Would it change the numbers for you? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, yeah, sales is a numbers game. I mean, it is cool as we sit, I haven't looked today, but we, Joel set me up on a, is Captivate what ends up sending everything out? Yeah, Joel. Captivate FM. And I thank you for mentioning that because I didn't mention them and I love them. I want to give them a plug too. I like to pat Libsyn on the back because they were in the game so long ago and they've done right. great things for the for the community too. But Captivate.fm is the company that I like to work with. It's the one that I recommend all my... So is that who hosts me? Is that what I call yes. it? Captivate hosts the audio <laughs> and then your your YouTube, your video goes on YouTube. But the audio is hosted by Captivate and that's right. where you get your stats for the downloads and everything. Yes. Right. So... It was really neat to be, to look at those and think 70 people gave me an hour of their time. I mean, I guess it, I don't know for sure if all 70 listened to the whole episode, but in my head. So let me give you a statistic there too, for people to, to, to track for themselves that like, what, what are you um, even looking for in trying to do one of these things? The number that I like to watch is downloads after a week, downloads after a month, of release mm -hmm. for each episode. And then you track that number over time, right? So episode one to episode two, how many did we do after a week? Episode one to episode four, how many did we do after a week? Episode one to episode four, how many did we do after a month? And that growth that you can see, right? Because the again, the way that these podcast apps work, when someone follows you, the default behavior, not everybody works like this. I have mindset to not download, but the default behavior is, that if you follow a show, each new episode gets downloaded automatically to your phone. That is mm -hmm. unbelievable access that we give to people. I mean, my wife, when she calls me, it does go through my do not disturb, but I don't have it set to automatically answer, right? If she FaceTimes right. me and I'm in the bathroom, my phone's not going to, yeah, go ahead and open it up. I want to talk to her <laughs> right away. And yet we give that sort of access almost to the podcast that we follow because we're saying when Rachel makes new content, go ahead and put it on my device. I want it right now. I want it for waiting right. for me when I go to the gym, when I make that commute in the morning, whatever. And that's the reason, by the way, most podcasts, if you'll notice, are released in the wee hours of the morning. I tell most of my clients you want to release either at 4 a.m. or 6 a.m. East Coast time 
I like 4 a.m. better than 6 a.m. just because it, it gives all of the servers an hour or two to populate and make sure that your file shows up everywhere, right? right. But but I want to be in people's I want to be a habit for people and I want my client shows to be a habit for their listeners. And that's the two things there are about consistency and then presentation, right? Putting your, your best foot forward. And you've done that. Yep. You've got a great logo. You've got good branding. Mm -hmm. Your title is so welcoming, right? How you get there. You mentioned that earlier, but I want to circle back to that mm. because I do think it is, I think that is so important to anybody who's thinking about making something is like, it needs to be useful for people. Right. Nobody, we, listen, everybody can use entertainment, but even the entertainment, honestly, has to have value. When I, I'm a big movie buff, Rachel, I watch a ton of movies. I watched 153 movies in 2023. <laughs> you kept track. That's impressive. Oh, I track, I track them with Letterboxd. It's a great service. I, <laughs> I put a little review on every one and I can see like my stats over time, how many total I I've reviewed it. and everything. How many movies. It's like Goodreads like, for movie buffs. It's exactly like Goodreads for movie buffs. It's so, it's so nice. See, I think and I've this is why I love the into. internet because it's like, there are these little places that if you don't care, you don't necessarily know about, but it's like, you hear about that. And it's this little micro community of how cool that if you're a movie buff, you can go and be in this space and like, I don't even know it exists. I just think that's what's so cool. Oh, it's wonderful. We can all find our place. But but the what I was going to say, though, is we, I watch that many movies and you're like, God, you must watch everything. No, I don't watch very many movies at all that I don't like. And even the ones that I don't like or that I give a bad rating. I feel like I have learned something there. I've either learned how to tell a story better or not to tell a story. I've had a moment of mm. self-reflection, right? I got to process some grief that I had through someone else's right. experience, or I got to process a fear that I have, but don't want to live in my own life. I can live it vicariously through somebody else and sort of like, it's like riding a roller coaster, right? Why do we enjoy that yeah. sort of feeling? It's like we, it's practice for the hard moments in our own life. Anyway, I feel that way about my client shows too, right? Your show just, it doesn't, it can't just be entertaining. It has to also be useful. So like your message of how you get there, first of all, you turned it outward instead of how I got here to how you get there because the name was taken. But I think that was fortuitous because it's not selfish or self-centered at all. And that wasn't your goal or message in the beginning. It's just you, the wording that you were thinking of, mm -hmm. but it's not about you. Rachel, it's not about me, Joel, and the journey that we're on. It's about everyone and the journey that they're on. And it's about how you get to wherever it is that you want to go. I don't want to run a yeah. mortgage business, right? So if you just had to tell me about how to run a better mortgage business, mm -hmm. that's not super helpful. I do want to own a home. I don't currently own a home. So you could tell me about that and that would be very useful. I have lots of clients that do that sort of thing. Those are useful right. shows. Everybody has a voice. They've got an audience that wants to listen to them. They just haven't had a chance to find them yet. Get, get out there, start spreading your message and people will find you and listen to what you have. If it's useful and valuable, that's the key. And you've triangulated yourself in that direction already. That's what I wanted to commend you on. The very idea well, thank of you. how you get there is like, first of all, it is audience centered and it's about their goals and aspirations, whatever that, whatever those are, you know? Yep. Well, and I think too, when I thought about how did I get here, it was more like introspective. And I knew I was saying it, saying like, we should all be asking like, how did I get here? Because one of the other things that I am so passionate about is I think just there's people that's floating along that aren't asking like, how did I get here? Did I make an intentional choice today? But that's a lot harder to articulate to articulate how you get there. I mean, it's a lot more self-explanatory and it is, it's more, it's more powerful. And I think uplifting than just where, how did I get here? Kind of can be felt in more of a negative context. So I'm really glad that it was taken and that I had to push myself harder to think on my messaging. But that is one of the biggest things that I wanted to reflect on, you know, after talking through the mechanics a little bit of podcasting was how for me, my, you know, I'm going to keep going with what I'm calling it. You know, my day job, it's so regulatory. The rules are decided. It's about working around, creating unique solutions, thinking, thinking through kind of the same fundamentals, but just in a different way to meet 
needs of different clients. Making this podcast has worked my creative muscles like never before. I can't believe how much creation has happened in 100 days. The most creation by far that's ever happened in my life. Trying to, you know, in decision making and deciding, not, not, you know, the name was just the beginning because then it was, okay, well, now we need a logo. Well, I looked, I went through 61 versions on Canva to work through a logo with my friend, Christian Barnes, who has his marketing firm, full feather design shout out to him he was so patient with me as i was trying to you know and not being a creative spirit anyways it was interesting to try to even articulate what i had in my mind about you know i'm thinking this and i i like this but i don't like this i couldn't even hardly articulate what i wanted you know, and i i went to pull some you know, options of ones that I liked from other logos. And then he would make me something. I'd be like, yeah, but not that. <laughs> I mean, it was just a whole thing. And then we finally, we had a set down together in person. This was probably maybe 10 or 12 drafts in. And so he, you know, we'd been trying to email or text back and forth about what I liked and what I didn't like. And Finally, he was like, I think I just need to come sit down with you. And I said, I think that's probably best. So he comes and sits down. We spend two hours. We are like working through colors, working through. I liked the idea of the road is that's in the logo was a huge part uh, component that I loved. But we were really trying to work on how to, how do we get it to fit how we need to. Well, he was like trying to copy and paste and accidentally duplicated it on accident. I said, Oh, stop. Don't don't delete that. I like it. You know, so I mean, one of the biggest elements of the logo was even an accident. I think that's so I think that's so common. though. Yeah. It's, well, it's sort of like the name, right? Like you didn't intend for the name to be what it was. And, and, and we were forced into necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that's absolutely yeah. true. By the way, God bless that designer. 61 revisions is a lot. It Rachel. was a lot. <laughs> He's one of my best friends. He's like my brother. And so the, you know, like I said, after we only did maybe about 10 and they were, they were like mock-ups, you know, it was like, okay, do you like this font? Do you like that font? Yeah. Broad you know, yes, it was broad strokes. So then, but then, you know, I mean, he, yeah, two hours was a long time for us to nitpick this, this design, nitpick the font, like figure out all that. And then we think we've nailed down something and like, it was so much better than what we had started with. I was kind of like getting antsy to be done. So I was like, okay, I think this is it. Like, I like it. I sent it to another person that was helping me with some of the startup marketing for the podcast. And she was like, yeah, I think you're going to get really tired of that pink and yellow. Maybe try to go something more like this. And it was like all brown. And I was thinking, I have worked two hours on this and you're telling me to ditch the pink and yellow but it really it was just so funny because it was another exercise of really my word of the year being rachel because i thought i gotta trust me and like she doesn't know the how, how you get there like i know it she's not in my brain this is not her podcast this is not her logo like, i cannot abandon something that i believe in and that i see you know represents what I'm getting at just off of one opinion. And so I just said, well, thank you for your feedback. But um, that's not what I that's not really the part I was asking about. Because I had placed myself as in a, like a mock up photo. It, so it was me and my just a uh, street clothes of the day, we were trying to figure out like how I exactly am going to be posed, you know, do I cross my arms? Am I sitting down? Is it full body? You know, they're like, just decision after decision on this thing. But that made me realize, okay, maybe I do need to tone it down a little bit. And, you know, uh, what was so like, look at what's important to me and, and pick and choose a little bit. So that's actually how the brown even got incorporated, which I love. It works out so well. So then after that, we have to do a picture. So then we're doing a photo shoot of like me trying to decide how I want to be placed in this picture. Thank goodness for how far Apple products have come because we're at least being able to like airdrop a picture to the MacBook, immediately put it in Canva and like, you know, pivot instead of trying to take all these pictures and then go sit down. But it was so funny too, because 
I'm standing there and Christian is just staring at me. I'm like, you have to tell me what I need to do. I don't even know what to do. And it was this really funny moment of just us. It was so, it was so much fun. It was stressful, but it, it's memories that I will have forever. And they're so vivid because it was just like, we were so out of our element. And the funny part is on the picture is the picture that I landed on. It was like the third set of poses, but it was the first one of those. And so it ended up being where it was like, okay, well, we hit the mark that ended up being that well, we love the first one more than we love those. And now I'm so proud of it to look at it and to know how much effort, how much creativity, how much I was stretched even to get that part done. But to recap too, another reason why for anybody listening of why I wanted to work with Joel is because I knew if I was trying to do the homemade podcast, I was going to give up on it, that it was not reasonable to think that I was going to week after week be able to come with that energy to like you said about when you start a new task, like if I start editing, it's going to take me way longer than it's going to take you. And then especially I'm not going to be as good at it. I'm going to barely have time to do the big stuff, let alone how you get in the weeds, listen to the episode and really truly produce it. So I just hit a wall where I thought if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it and it's going to be good enough. And I'm going to be proud enough of the output that I'm going to be encouraged to keep going. And because like you said, video is already a huge part of my brand. I knew that I wanted to go ahead and start that way too. But then you, when you sat down, you were like, gave me marching orders. I picked music. We had to record. I had to write and record a trailer. I had to write and record an intro. We had to set up all these sites. I had a batch recordings. We had to make a marketing plan. I mean, there is a lot of work that has been done to even get here. And there's still so many more plans that we're even still working on. Like right now, as we sit, I still don't have an outro to the episodes, but that's something I'm I'm working on and we're working on and the way like you said about how do I start an episode you know all that's going to evolve over time but you can't wait for all of that to be perfectly in place or you're just never going to end up putting a show out there you know it's so it's so fascinating to me when I think about it Rachel that, that any normal person ever starts a show by themselves like I I look back Okay, so when I started, well, first of all, when I started, I was broke. I was broke as a joke. I had two kids. I was a single dad dating the woman that I'm, I'm married to now, the love of my life, Kelly. And uh, my my best friend had this successful job. And so he had some disposable income. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. You were talking about in the very beginning, your original conception was that, like, you were going to do this as a partnership with a friend, but you were deciding that you were going to pay, you know, to, to export some of the responsibilities. And what does that mean for that partnership? Now it was great in the beginning because I had time and talent and he had a little bit of cash. And so anything that we needed to spend money on, he'd pay for the hosting or whatever. Right. And I would take care of the actual, the work he'd just come into the studio and record. And that was the end of it. That was a great way for me to start the show. And of course I had a lot of, already built in talent from the job that I was doing on a regular basis. But like, even me, we did like the first, I don't know, five or six episodes. And we were trying to host the files in Dropbox and, and creating an RSS feed on our own through some weird third party service and feed burner or something from Google. Anyway, it was crazy. We finally moved to Libsyn. Like, I don't know, I guess we were two months in or three months in at that point and got a real media mm -hmm. host and, you know, but, but like, if you don't know about this world now, you can go on YouTube, you know, and search. A friend of mine the other day said that he had been getting his answers on how to start a podcast from chat GPT. I suppose that's one way to do it. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. That to me, it just sounds like one more to do list before you can even start the podcast. Like, I mean, it just stresses me out thinking about it. But a lot of these people are putting out like one episode every month. And I knew from all the education that I'd been listening to is the most successful podcasts are consistent. Like you said earlier is if somebody is choosing to follow and let you drop into their phone, if you're dropping in every week, not every 30 days, it makes a difference. It totally does. It, I mean, think about it in your own life. The friends who you only talk to every quarter or at Christmas or, you know, 
at class reunion or something. Those aren't your friend friends. You know, the people who, when work goes bad and you think, boy, I ought to complain to X or I ought to ask for a little pat on the back from Y, those are your friends. Those are your closest ones. And so if you want to be a podcast that matters to people and not, look, not everybody's podcast is going to be that, right? Some can literally just be top of funnel content marketing for their business. And there's nothing wrong with that. Make that as useful as you can too. But know what your goals are in the beginning. And and Rachel, your goals were broader than just establishing a little base for your business, than just putting your name out there. Mm-hmm. You did want to build this community and, and draw in stories, learn for yourself, as well as bringing information to your audience. And I think if you have that goal in mind, then the possibilities are very, you know, infinite and the roadblocks are very few. Right. So right. you can do really anything you if you want to talk to a professional athlete or a guy who runs a local grocery store or anywhere in between. Right. There all of those people will have an interesting story to tell and can have something of value for what you're doing and, and what your audience is yeah. looking for. You could put constraints on it. You can make it more wide open. I, I think that there are ways to do this all on your own if you want to. It is a hu- even today with all the tools that exist out there, it's a huge time commitment mm-hmm. and people need to know that going in. Even for you, where you have hired a, a professional, think about the hours that you've now spent in recording. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how many, how many recordings have you done? And you do long recordings, Rachel, <laughs> like this one is now going pretty long. But like, yeah. you, so when you do those recordings, like you spend hours and hours on this project Never mind the thought and time that you spent there too, but like literally putting the sweat in, you've already spent, I don't know, 10 hours, 12 hours on this total, close to that. Yeah, probably at least. Yeah. And and so it's not nothing, even when you're spending money to get it done. Right. So well, the, the point is like, do something that's going to be useful for your audience, do something that's going to be valuable for you and not just monetarily, if that's not your goal, right. but you do something that's interesting, do something that's compelling, do something that you're going to get excited to have the conversation, not just to share the conversation. Exactly. And that's what, um, to kind of wrap us up, because not only are we celebrating a hundred days in unpacking, you know, what goes into the first 100 days um, for me of how you get there, understanding, you know, how long have I been working on this? What does it take, et cetera. But also just the, the inception of something so brand new, it's been neat and something like I've never experienced before, just to see even the mindset shifts that can happen in a hundred days. Um, you know, but we talked a little bit about this before we hit record, but when I first started thinking about how you get there, I was really wrapped up in the thought about investing in the podcast with help getting hiring a professional to help me and was already. And this is something I apparently, I know I have a problem with because this is, I keep hitting on this point in the episodes of, I was already worried about, okay, I got to make like this outcome happen to justify spending money to make a podcast. And so the, the short, the, the short result to get there, the, the quick outcome was, well, you are a mortgage loan officer, so make it a part of your, you know, make that mesh. You know, you are the same person. P- people work with people they like, know, and trust. All true. But I, for a little bit, felt so required to pigeonhole into the, okay, how you get there is only going to be this funnel and this um, this layer of me to to help in a pro- my professional life because I wanted to be able to justify and, and feel like I was, it was going to be a marketing strategy just for that reason. And really, and that was a, that was a um, thought from a, f- a point of fear because I was not ready to admit and believe in myself and in how you get there, that it can exist and thrive and flourish and cover its own investment eventually on its own. It doesn't need even necessarily necessary just the only layer of it going to me as a loan officer. And in the hundred days of creating this and realizing how much I love it, how much I'm already invested in how you get there as 
as its own brand and its own thing. I, b- I believe in it more, you know, I I'm buying in as I've, as I've gone to think, okay, this is so much bigger than just something that I can do to get in front of more people. So they build this connection with me as somebody they like, know, and trust, which I still hope happens, but that's not the goal. And I finally admitted that to myself. I would be doing this. It was really a conversation that hasn't dropped yet with my friend, Michaela, that made me realize I would be doing this if it never made it me a penny because I love it and I love doing it. And they, the time, the extra hours put in, it doesn't feel like work versus, you know, I love what I do in my career, but it is a career. And there are days where, you know, there are parts of it that I don't want to do if I, if I don't get, if that, if that's not how I make a living, I could talk about this and this was already what I was doing in my free time already. It's just a, a special place for it. And so that right there is something that I wanted to celebrate and was really even what got me reflecting on the hundred days as a whole, because part of it is that you just have to start creating and you have to start doing, and you've got to let go of the rules and then things will come into, you will gain clarity and definition from there. A million percent, a million percent. I, you know, we don't, we don't just live to work. You know, we, we work to live. Mm -hmm. And I think, we need to bring that to to all of our projects. Honestly, we need to bring that back to our work, though, too. Like, whatever whatever we do for a living, I mean, unless it is truly an abusive job or something, you're in a bad situation. Then, if you're listening to this and you're in a bad situation, you should get out. You know, Amen. I wasn't in a bad situation. I was just I was capped in my situation, and I wanted a better one. I was. I've been there. Get out. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I, one of my, one of my favorite podcasters, uh, this very quickly, I'll wrap up on this story because this, I think this is a great example of this. This guy runs his own podcast network now. Uh, it's called relay.fm. It's basically tech focused, but, but he and, and one of his best friends have this business that they built together over the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years Mm -hmm. now. And it all started when he went independent, he was working at a bank and he was like a, not a teller, but like a, you know, a clerk or something at a mm. bank in, uh, in England, this guy lives in London, but he woke up one morning and he went to tie his shoes and the dress shoes that he wore to work every day, the shoelaces snapped. And he had been thinking about going independent. He had this podcasting thing that had started, mm-hmm. but they were, they wanted to be sure of how the business was growing before he left his job job. But he broke his, his shoelaces that morning and said, I'm, I'm not buying new shoelaces for these dress shoes. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to keep this job anymore. I'm going independent today. In fact, I'm going to put in my two weeks notice or whatever it was. And like, he just, he just pulled the trigger and made a move in his life because he wasn't perfectly aligned with what he was doing on a day-to-day basis. That's exactly the motivation that found me that January in 2016, when the boss says, you got to go now, or you got to wait till next year. And I went, well, we're going now then, aren't we? Like if you're in a bad situation, then pull the trigger and get yourself to a better situation. Like make that move for yourself. You can do it. But if you're in a job like Rachel's, Rachel, you love your job. It's still a job. I adore my job. It's still a job. There are days when it's hard. So what you need to do is find the things in your job that really do light you up. For instance, Rachel, the part that I see you light up about is the conversations, the personal relationships that you get to build with people, right? right? Seeing them make a new milestone and make a change in life. It's not about your own bottom line. It's about their bottom line over time that really flips your switch, right? So find that part for your, honestly, you know what I like best about my job? It's the initial conversation. I love hearing someone go, here's my dreams for a thing that I want to make. And how do I, how do I get there? Yeah. And I can tell them how we'll get there, you know, over time, it'll take a while. And maybe the final dream isn't exactly what you've envisioned, but I can get you to a result that's going to bring you pleasure Mm -hmm. and it's going to grow your bottom line. That's the other thing too. I can tell you how to make it grow your bottom line as well. That's not the only reason, but it's all, we have to, it all works together. Talk about work-life balance. And I do think that I I don't want to be one of those like hustle and grind people but at the same time, like integration is the better idea. If you, if you, you can enjoy something more when it sustains itself though, because on the hard days, it's like, okay, this is at least like helping over here. But what you said too, it's, it speaks to me because I came from a situation where all I had unfortunately known 
was being miserable at work. And so the second I wasn't miserable at work and I found my career in mortgage, it's like, this is it. I love it. And for a while, you know, that was the only thing that I let define me. And then you start to, and then for me, it's like, I've started to grow as a person and realize I can love mortgage, but also have this passion for something that's totally separate at the end of the day from my job. And that's okay. And that doesn't mean that I don't love my job or I don't love my career. Um, I think that, you know, real estate is a culture sometimes where it fosters this like badge of honor for the people that allegedly like, you know, live to work and that real estate's their life and blah, blah, blah. Just like I told you earlier, it's like, you know, I don't want a podcast about mortgages. I've talked about that all day. So <laughs> that is not at all what I want this to be. And it never was, it never was on my radar because I'm so much more than that. And now I'm letting how you get there be so much more than that. And I'm just thankful I figured that out a hundred days before publishing, you know, that this hundred day period is a blessing was a total, it, not that it was, a, I don't want to say blessing in disguise because I never thought of it as a bad thing. I just thought of it as like, this is just part of the process, but it was a blessing I didn't see coming because I'm so grateful. I had this epiphany about letting how you get there be its own thing, be everywhere that you can find me, you know, let it be synonymous with me, not just on my one Rachel Denson MLO Instagram, but let it share it with the world everywhere. Don't try to just funnel people to this one place that really has nothing to do with the content to find it before I, I, I went live because that's why it's already doing so well as it, as it is. And, and I'm grateful for you to be along for the ride with me as we, you know, have bigger dreams to accomplish. And you're still telling me how we get there because we've got other things in, in the works and I'm excited about it. I'm excited to be a part of it too, Rachel. And I, I'm just thankful. And I, anybody who's listening to this, even if you're not going to create content, you're like, well, I'm never going to make a podcast. I don't even do, you know, uh, Instagram videos. That's fine. But do think about the ways Rachel mentioned it earlier. The beauty of the internet, honestly, is that no matter what your passion or hobby or interest or, you know, uh, or the thing you make your money on, no matter what that is, you can connect directly yes. with other people who are striving or seeking those same things, no matter where they are. It used yep. to be you had to find that one weirdo in your neighborhood <laughs> or your town who liked what you liked, right? Well, now you can find those weirdos all over the planet, right? And you can all just get together in a group and hang yes. out anytime you want to and share that message and share that attitude, which makes the bad Mondays or the down quarters or the pandemic years or whatever, it makes all of that palatable in a way that it, it just, I don't think it would have been any other time in, in history. So I'm thankful. Just as we wrap up from your experience with the Saints Super Bowl, case in point, it's yes. those things, yes. the like, silver linings of life, they're out there in the internet makes them be, think, you know, too clicks away instead of this long journey. Yes. Yes. A million percent. So if you're having a gloomy, On that if you're having a gloomy Monday, <laughs> like, like get out there and find the things that bring you joy and happiness and lean into those in 2024. You got lots of time to do it and you can do it just like Rachel did and make it happen for yourself. That's how you'll get there. Yes. I love it, man. You're, are you a professional or something? I've done a few of these before, <laughs> Rachel. It's true. It's true. I love it. Well, Joel, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much. If you're listening to this, by the way, and you like Rachel want a little handholding through this process, I I'm taking clients pro podcasting services.com, Joel Sharpton.com. You can find me there too. And, uh, I'll, we'll have my email address in the, in the show notes too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks Rachel. Thank you for joining me this week. I hope this episode met you where you were at and it's given you your own clarity on steps forward for how you get there. Wherever and whatever that is, it is important and your dreams matter. I would love to connect with you personally. You can email me at howyougetthere at gmail.com or you can find me at Rach Ross Denson on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Threads, and X. Will you please take a few seconds to subscribe, rate, and review How You Get There wherever you listen to your podcast? Please know you are playing a part in making my dream come to life. And for that, I am so grateful. 
Don't forget, if where you want to go in the future involves a home loan, I would love to help you. Find me on Instagram at Rachel Denson underscore MLO to learn from my videos or use the link in the bio to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me. Hope to see you back here next week where we'll keep talking all about how you get there.